All right. Now, the topic for tonight's sermon is loving one another. And this is a commandment that we see many times throughout the Bible. And we find, you don't have to turn around, I'm going to read some of these commandments that, we've all, that are in the New Testament. And we've gone through this real briefly in, in um, our Wednesday night Bible study. So John chapter 13 and John chapter 15 both tell us this. I didn't really get too far into detail on the topic that I'm preaching about tonight when we covered these, these chapters. So I'm going to read them real briefly. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So this is Jesus Christ saying, look, I'm giving you a new commandment. I'm telling you that you love one another. As I have loved you, I want you to love one another. And in John 15, verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So he's basically repeating, reiterating what he said in John chapter 13. He says, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 17 says, These things I command you, that ye love one another. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible reads, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So all throughout the New Testament, we see, we see statements like this that talk about loving one another. And this is something that we ought to have. This is something we ought to do. And the first point I want to, I want to point out is that love is not just some emotion. It's not just a feeling. Now, is there feelings involved with loving people? Sure there are. Not always, but, but oftentimes there are. You think of, I know the love that I have towards my children and especially towards my wife are associated with a, with a feeling in my heart, with an emotion that I have inside of me. Um, but you can have love towards people without really experiencing a sensation of a feeling that comes over you. And the reason why we know that's true, for one, is because emotions we generally don't have much control over. When, when um, you get feelings of sadness or feelings of anger, you, know, you need to be able to control your body and be temperate in all things. But oftentimes emotions are hard to control. But the Bible's commanding us here, Jesus Christ commanded us to love one another. This is something that we need to do. And it's not just a robotic love. It's a love of compassion and empathy and looking and caring towards other people. But it is something that we can do that's capable of doing without necessarily requiring an emotion. I think the more you decide to love somebody and, and act on that, the more you probably will gain a lot of those feelings as well. Now, I want to focus in on 1 John 3. Look at verse number 16. This is going to give us the roadmap for, what, for, for the sermon. Verse number 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Remember we saw earlier, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus says. And in 1 John 3, 16 it's telling us again that, that he laid down his life for us. And if we are to love one another the way Jesus did, he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for other people. Now, how do we do that? And in order to even contemplate ever doing that for somebody, you have to esteem other people better than yourself. You have to think of, oh, well, it's not, you know, if you have this attitude, well, I'm more important than that person. Why in the world would you give your life for them then? How would you love them? How could you possibly love another person enough to give your life for them if you just think that, well, I'm just better than them anyway, so you know, it's better for me to be here than it is for that person? No, if you love someone enough to give your life for them, you're already going to be esteeming them better than yourself. You're going to be looking at other people saying, you know what, I want them to succeed. I want something for, you know, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I want them to improve. I want them to get better. I want them to improve their relationship with God, whatever it may be, to get better in their life and you, because you are loving them the way that Christ has loved you. Think about, and think about this. Jesus Christ was the most important man to walk this earth. There's nobody better or more important or anything. If you were to say, well, wait, no, Jesus, you shouldn't die. We all should die, not, but not you. That would be a true statement and accurate because Jesus shouldn't have died. But be, even though he was the best person ever, he was God in the flesh, didn't deserve death whatsoever, he was showing the example 
of how to love one another by offering up himself, even though we are all undeserving of that love, even though we are all undeserving of him giving his life for us. This is the type of love that he had for us, and he's showing us the type of love, and that's what his commandment is talking about, that we love one another as he has loved us in giving him his life for us. That is in 1 John 3, 16. Look at verse number 17. It says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He's saying, like, if you have this world's good, meaning if you, if you have material possessions, if you have some money, if you have some things, right, that other people need, that a brother in Christ needs, you have, you have something, you can fulfill somebody's need. And I'm not talking about somebody's want and say like, oh, well, you have a boat and, and you know, your, your Christian brother wants a boat, so you ought to give it to him. No, if someone has a need, like we have food. Okay, we're not the richest people in the world, but we have food. And if somebody has a need and they don't have any food and they need to eat, well, guess what? If we, if we just say, no, we need to keep our storage. We need to keep this food for ourselves, you know, because I don't know. Maybe I'll lose my job. Maybe something will happen. I just need to make sure. We just need to hoard our food here. I know you need it right now and, you know, we're doing fine. That's not love. He's saying, don't do that. He said, how dwelleth the love of God in you? If you can behave like that, if you can act like that when you see someone that has need, when you see your brother in Christ that has need, how does the love of God dwell in you? You ought to be able to provide for people who are in need when, when you're capable of doing so. He says when you have this world's good, when you're able to do that, then you ought to do that. And then verse number 18, it says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So he's saying, you know, love isn't just saying I love you. It's not just saying, oh, yeah, okay. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, I'll do anything for you. Oh, yeah, I'm here for you. I'm your best friend. I'm your brother. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. I love you. But those words can all be meaning. They are, they are meaningless if you don't follow that up with action. If there's, if there's no way of, of doing a deed, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say that it's just like in James when it says, you know, you say you have faith. He's like, show me your, uh, um, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Right? It, the way that you can show faith, faith is something that's invisible to us. God can see our faith, but man can't see it unless you're doing works. That's why you do the works to show that you have that faith. That's an outward uh, expression or appearance of your faith. The same way that, that doing good deeds for other people and helping them out in their time of need uh, is that, that outward expression. It's the proof of your love for them. It shows that you, that you do love them. It's not just lip service. It's not just saying you love. Like God said, um, this people... Um, I forget what the exact quote, but it's this people you know, basically speak well of them and say that they love them, but their hearts are far from me. He, he says, they, they give me lip service. They talk about me as if they love me, but their hearts are far from me. And that's what it's saying in John 3, 18. He says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Don't just let it come out of your mouth. But he says, but in deed and in truth. And these are the two things we'll be focusing on tonight is our love in deed and then our love in in truth. These are the ways that we ought to be loving people. So the first one is by loving indeed. Now, I want to point this out before, right before I get into loving indeed, because I skipped over this. I need, I need to get back. There's a very important point about love not being an emotion. It's something that we need to learn. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. This is our memory verse. This is what we're working on learning. Titus chapter 2. Because this is an extremely important concept to understand. And this is one of the reasons why this, this, this sermon is so critical today and why it's so important to understand this concept of love and loving one another. Because we live in a society of people who don't understand this concept. We have the highest divorce rate probably that's ever been since the world began in our country today. It's like over half of marriages now are ending in divorce. And what's one of the most common reasons that people give? And you hear this all the time. People say, oh, I just don't love them anymore. You hear the wife or the husband saying, I, oh, I just, I don't, I don't love them anymore. I don't love myself. I thought they were the right person, but I just, I don't think I love them anymore. 
It's because they don't understand love at all. They have no concept of what love is. They're thinking that love is just some emotion that they have in their heart. They think it's just some feeling. So that when they meet somebody new, it's exciting and there's these things going on and you, and you feel an emotion in your heart of, of the excitement of getting to know somebody and oh, you have a lot of similarities and you like doing the same thing and you have an attraction and then they feel that, that oh, well, I just don't love them anymore when you stop feeling some of those emotions that you had when you first met somebody. And sometimes those feelings can fade a little bit after a year or two. But the, and I think one of the most important reasons why those feelings fade is because they're not truly loving them. They're just relying on their emotion. When you truly love somebody, you do things for them. You, you, you think about them and you do things for them. And in so doing, I think that will have an impact on your emotion. Look at Titus 2. Look at verse number 3. Because this is something that needs to be taught. And, he's, and, and most people today have no idea about love. Verse number three says, The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. We see the Bible here commanding us to love and here specifically commanding the aged women to teach the younger women. This is, this is the job. Okay, the older ladies in church, your job is to teach the younger women that they need to love their husbands. If you have the older generation teaching them, look, it's not all going to be roses. Hey, that feeling that you had right at the beginning, that's not necessarily going to last all throughout your marriage. You need to love your husband and you need to learn how to love your husband. You need to, this is something that needs to be taught and needs to be learned by people that you need to love your husband, respect them, and do things for them. And this is something that Titus is admonishing the old women, the aged women. Well, Paul is admonishing, um, is giving advice to Titus that he runs the church this way and lets the aged women know, hey, look, you need to be in behavior as becometh holiness. If you're going to be righteous, if you're going to be doing that which is right in God's eyes, you're going to teach the young women that they need to love their husbands. If you have the young women being taught to love their husbands, they're loving their husbands, you're not going to hear, well, I don't love my husband anymore. And all this divorce happens. This is the solution for the problem. But how do we love one another? We, the first thing we're going to look at is loving indeed. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. We're going to get our first example of loving indeed. We saw from 1 John 3, there's loving in deed and loving in truth. In deed and in truth. We're going to start by looking at the loving in deed. I think this one's probably a little bit easier for us to comprehend. And it's really not a difficult concept. It's just one that I think a lot of people don't think about. Romans 13, look at verse number 8. Romans 13, 8. The Bible says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And this is really interesting. He says here, the first thing in verse 8 is to love one another. And then he goes on to, to, to state that, look, if you love one another, you've already fulfilled the law. So what does this tell us? The law can tell us about love. If we already fulfill the law by loving one another, well, now we can look to the law and say, okay, well, what do we do in the law? That's going to prove that I love somebody. It's going to show my love for somebody that I have love by, ful by fulfilling the law. And he says for this, he, he, he iterates this in verse 9. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? Committing adultery, cheating on your spouse, cheating on your wife. Obviously, if you're going to commit adultery, that's, that is proof that you don't really love your spouse. You don't love your life when you're, when you're breaking your vow of, of keeping yourself only unto them. And you're, and you're laying with another man or another woman and, um, and just being a, a total traitor and, and, and you know, hurting that person. Because that is one of, probably one of the most painful things that you can do to someone who's married is, as a spouse is to cheat on them. That hurts. That hurts a lot. That's, that's inflicting 
a, a heartache upon your spouse and that is not love for them. So he's saying, look, obviously one of the commandments is not to commit adultery. So if you keep that commandment right away, you're showing your love by, by not doing these things. And he says also, thou shalt not kill. Okay, I don't even think I have to go into that. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You're not lying about other people. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is all part of love. When you're not doing harm, you're not doing bad things unto people, you, well, you love them. Right? When you're, when you're not aggressing against them, when you're not doing things, that shows your love. And that's why he says love is the fulfilling of the law. The law is about love. It's about loving people. So God gives us these, these negative commandments saying not to do anything that would be contrary to loving somebody. Okay, so here we get to get an understanding of the definition of love by the, the contradiction of love, by, by these sins that we can commit. And this is also exactly why we preach, one of the reasons why we preach on the law so much, is to help us understand how to love one another, how to fulfill that commandment that Jesus gave. People like to tell you, oh, you know, just focus on love, focus on what Jesus said. Well, yeah, in order to focus on Jesus' commandment, in order to focus on loving one another, we see right here in Romans 13, well, we should probably understand the law then. We need to know the law. We need to, to preach and teach the law and understand the law because that is bound in loving one another. Turn, if you would, to um, just flip back to Romans chapter 12. We'll get there in a second. First John chapter 5, verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Shane, so this is the love of God. If you say, oh, you know, people like to say, oh, yeah, I love God. You talk to so many people on the street and just ask them the question, do you love God? You know, if they believe in God, say, do you love God? I think the vast majority of people say, yeah, of course I love God. You know, God's good. God is love. I love God. He's, he's merciful. He's long over. He's all these great things, these great attributes that they love about God. And those are great attributes. But I'll tell you what, if you ask a person if they love God and they're just living a life of wickedness and living a life of sin and living a life of the world, they don't love God. They may say it that they love God with their mouth, but in their heart they don't love God because the Bible says right here that this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. If you're not keeping His commandments, then you don't love God. It's that simple. We need to obey God. We need to obey His commandments. We need to obey the law. And, and that is how we can show our love to God. Jesus Christ said so in John 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is how we can show our love to God. So therefore, if someone is not keeping those commandments, they do not love God no matter what they say, no matter, no matter what they think they feel in their heart. They might have an emotion that says, oh man, I feel really close to God. Are you keeping his commandments? Are you even trying to keep his commandments? And this doesn't say, try to keep my commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is what you need to do. This is how we show our love to Christ. Romans 12. You're in Romans 13. Flip back to this Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. And this goes back to that concept of putting other people before yourself. That is how you're going to love them. When you look at someone, you look at their needs, you can look at how can I help that person. That is love. When you're caring for somebody else, this is the love that Jesus wants us to have for other people. And part of that is love be without dissimulation. Don't let your love be fake. Don't let it just be in words only. And then he follows this up with saying, abhor that which is evil. Evil is something that does inflicting harm on other people. We need to hate that. We need to not be tolerant of the evil. We need to hate it. It needs to be something that we completely hate in order to hate the evil. That's, that's how we're going to gain that love for other people when we hate evil coming upon them. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. Just before the book of um, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, or 1st and 2nd Peter. 
1 Peter chapter 3, near the end of the Bible. So again, we're talking about loving in deed, loving the things that we do. One of the ways we love in the things that we do, you know, we, we don't transgress against other people by breaking the law, by committing adultery, by stealing, by lying about them, by, by coveting things that they have. All of those things are not loving. So in order to love someone, we need to make sure we're not doing those things. We, Jesus Christ said, if we love me, if we love God, we need to keep his commandments. First Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. So love, love like your, your brethren, like your brothers, like your, like your family members. Right? You love you, your family, at least you ought to. And again, I, I think that this culture is just sick and twisted and a lot of things have been, have been skewed. But you know, normally, families should have a very strong relationship together. You should have a love towards your brothers, towards your sisters and your mother and your father that's really tight-knit and close because you're family. Just by virtue of being family members, you should be, you know, in a, in a sense, dedicated toward them, love them. Obviously, you don't love them more than God, but that should be the next thing is your family. You should have that love towards your family where you would do things for them and whatever they need, you're going to help them out. You're there for them because you're family. And... This is the type of love that, that he's explaining that we need to have. Love as brethren. Have compassion one of another. Look at other people's needs. Have compassion on the things that they're going through and help them out. He says, be pitiful, showing pity on someone. Be courteous. Be polite. Speak well to people. Don't speak down to people. When you're courteous, again, it's, it's a little bit of humility involved in that because you're speaking to someone with respect. You're being courteous. You're not thinking so highly of yourself that you can talk down to anybody and say whatever you, you, know, you want to say. He's saying, no, be pitiful, be courteous. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. And this is really important. The way that we love other people, when someone does you wrong, he says, don't render evil for evil. Don't just go right back and do something bad to that person because they did something bad to you. That is the opposite of what we need to do. He says, but contrary, on the contrary, you need to give them a blessing. And you have to fight the flesh against this. You need to understand that you can't take vengeance on people. When people are sliding you, when people are doing you wrong, when you think, man, I'm doing all this work and nobody's helping me out, and, and you can start getting bitter against other people and start having bad thoughts against other people, we need to just say, you know what? No. I'm just going to keep ministering. I'm going to keep serving. And I'm just going to do that which is right. And maybe through my actions, maybe through my deeds, they'll speak a lot louder than my words. Maybe by my actions, people will say, you know, it's one thing for a pastor to be up here and say, you need to be going slow winning. You need to live this way. You need to do this. You need to do that. And this is what the Bible says. And then he goes out and does something else. Why would anyone want to listen to you? We need to live a life as an example because oftentimes when someone says, you know, I heard him say that, but it didn't really, uh, it didn't really stick with me. But man, I see he's out doing this all the time. He's always going out so and he's always reading his Bible. Man, I talk to him and he knows where this stuff is. He's not just saying, it's not just lip service. This is something he actually does. This sticks with people. I had a conversation with a friend the other day and he said that, you know, this conversation that we had was, was about salvation and eternal life. And he says, you know, the things that you said to me, they've... they've You've done more to make me think than anyone else I've ever talked to about this subject. And that's because you know, I was able to bring up a lot of different scriptures. And again, I'm not exalting myself, but this is, these are the things, that, this is part of the reason why we need to, to learn these things and know these things because they, they are important and they'll have an influence and an impact on other people. When other people can see, oh, you're not just saying these things and you're a total hypocrite. Because that, uh, that, honestly, that drives a lot of people out of church. It's just a hypocrisy. I don't know how many times I've talked to people that say, yeah, I used to go to church, but I didn't really like it. There's a lot of people gossiping and backbiting and, you know, and, and you see them and, and they're all saying amen and, and they're coming all dressed nice on Sunday. But then I see them during the week and they're a completely different person. And people don't like to see that. It's, it, it puts a sour taste in your mouth. And unfortunately, a lot of people get out of church for that very reason. We need to be better than that. We need to live above reproach. We need to be able, when someone does you wrong, to say, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to love that. And in fact, I'm going to love that person. Not only am I just going to let that go, I'm going to bless that person. 
This is how we overcome evil with good. And it's in the, the, the end of that verse in 1 Peter 3, 9 says, But contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, this is what you're called to do, that ye should inherit a blessing. So when you do that, and this is a, another consolation you can have, is that you will inherit a blessing. God sees what you're doing. He's, he knows it's not always easy to do that. It's a choice you make, just like in your marriage. It's a choice. Hey, you're having problems with your spouse and you think you don't love them anymore. You need to choose to do something about that. You need to say, I am going to love my husband or I am going to love my wife. I don't care if she, you know, bad mouths me and she badgers me and she's not doing her job and she's doing all these things wrong. You know what? I'm going to love her anyways. I'm going to make the choice to say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something nice for her. I'm going to help her out. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to you know, do some, some chore that I know is going to help her out or, or take the kids out of her hair for a while so she can get some peace. Whatever it may be, you need to choose to do those types of things, even if you don't have a certain feeling in your heart. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, the more you continue to do for someone else, the more love you will start to feel for that person. Whether it be just a brotherly love from a friend or a relative, the more you do for someone, the more you put your heart, your soul, and effort in work into doing something for someone else, the more affection you're going to have for that person. And that's a fact. And if you're having problems with your marriage or in a friendship or anything, you know what you need to do. You need to overcome the evil that's, that exists. And I don't care who's at fault. You can't control what other people do. But you can control what you do. You need to make the choice, I am going to love. I am going to love someone else. This is what I am going to do, even if it means, even if it's when another person does me wrong. I'm still going to just love them and, and continue doing that which is right. I'm not going to let them suck me down and drag me down into their fleshly state of, of trying to then be vengeful and do something bitter and, and nasty against them and recompense their evil for evil. I'm going to recompense their evil for good. Just as Jesus, you know, again, he said, Greater love hath no man than this a man lay down his life for his friends. He gave himself for us. We didn't deserve it. Someone who does you wrong, they don't deserve, they don't deserve your love. They don't deserve you doing nice things for them when they do you wrong. But we didn't deserve Jesus Christ's love for us and dying on the cross for us. That's not something we deserved either. And he gave us the example, and this is the way that we need to follow. That's loving indeed. That's doing, that's actually having the actions to carry out that love, to, to express that love, to have that love is just, just by doing things, doing these deeds, obeying the commandments. Now we're going to look into loving in truth. Because First John 3, remember we saw loving in deed and in truth. These are two th aspects of our Christian life that we need to make sure we have down. Loving in deed, it's pretty easy to comprehend loving in deed. It's, just, it's doing good things for other people, being humble and, and um, putting people above yourself and doing things for them. Helping people out in their time of need. Loving in truth. Now, oftentimes, love, loving someone enough to tell them the truth is not always easy or pleasant. It's not always a nice thing that we get to go through, but it's necessary. And I'm, I'm going to use an example here. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 13. And the example we're going to, going to use to help us understand loving in truth is disciplining our children. So think about disciplining your children. And turn to Proverbs 13. Because this definitely has to do with love. Proverbs 13, verse 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him quickly. I'll read that again. He that spareth his rod. You know how a rod that's used for beating a child's rear end when they need to be disciplined. He that, he that doesn't do that, he that spares the rod. He said, if you, if you spare your rod, you hate your son. He said, no, but I love my son. No, you hate him if, you, if you're not spanking him properly, if you're not doing the, what the Bible says, if you're sparing your rod, if you're withholding that correction that a child needs 
when they need it. If you withhold that correction, you hate your child. He says, but he that loveth him chasteneth him quickly. If you love them, you're going to do it right away. You're not going to say, oh, man, I'm too busy. Wait, well, I'm watching TV. Oh, I'm doing this. I'm busy doing something else. Yeah, they need to be, they need to be disciplined, but I'm too busy doing this. I'll just get to it later. He says, no, if you love them, you're just going to do it quickly. You're going to do it right away. You're going to see that action that needs to be corrected, and you're going to take action with the rod that you need to, that, that the Bible's talking about here. And if we're unclear what that rod is, turn to Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to see exactly what that is. There is no, because a lot of people like to say, oh, well, you know, the rod's just like a guiding rod. It's not something that they're talking about actually using to inflict pain on your child. You know, people have all these different explanations of what the Bible's talking about. Well, give me an explanation for Proverbs 23, verse number 13. Because this spells it out so that there should be no confusion over what we're talking about with raising our children. Proverbs 23, 13 says, withhold not correction from the child. Okay, correct him. Yeah, see, correcting him. That's just telling him that they're doing what's wrong and, and make him do what's right. With all that correction from the Bible. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Oh, beat? Yeah, the Bible's all about beating him with the rod. That rod that we just read about in Proverbs 13, this is the same rod we're talking about here. That if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The Bible says right here in black and white that the, the clear scriptural way that we need to be disciplining and correcting our children is by beating them with the rod and delivering their soul from hell. Now, delivering someone's soul from hell, that sounds like it's loving to me. That is true love. When you're, when you're getting somebody to not go and burn in hell for eternity, that is a very strong statement in the Bible here. That constitutes love more than just about anything else I could think of. Is preventing a soul from going to hell. Now, is disciplining your child fun? Is it, is it a pleasant thing? Is it, is it fun to spank your child and, and to hear him cry and be upset and everything else? No, of course it's not. No, I don't think any parent really likes doing that. It's not, it's not enjoyment. It's not always, love is not always fun, though. Love is not always pleasant, and it could even be painful when it comes down to giving a spanking to your child. It's painful for them. But it's necessary. It's necessary. We need to do these things, and it's out of love that we do these things. And these days, there are a lot of people that would get offended just at the suggestion that they should spank their children in, in discipline. But we can see it. I mean, it's in black and white in the Bible. Some people today, you just bring that up and that's just going to offend them immediately. But what still needs to be preached, I don't care if somebody gets offended at me preaching that they need to spank their children, that they need to beat them with the rod, as the Bible says, because it's what the Bible says. This isn't my opinion on the matter. It's just, it's written in black and white. You could take it or leave it. And if it offends you, then you're not offended at me. You're offended at God. You're offended at his words. And you can take that up with God personally if you don't like what it says. <clears throat> so we learn from this. One of, the, one of the concepts that we learn from this is that in loving our children... Sometimes we have to do things that aren't pleasant. Sometimes it's not, it's not always a mushy feeling. It's not always something that's, when you love somebody, it's not always even an enjoyable experience for everybody involved, right? But you do things out of love. I discipline our children. I spank our children because I love them and I want them to learn right from wrong and I want them to grow up right. I love them. And that's why, that's why they get the proper correction that the Bible lays out for us to do. Um, now, another another example here. Let's see, you know most people would agree that helping someone out would be considered an act of love when you do something nice for them, when you help people out. But sometimes, in order to help someone, you have to tell them things that they don't want to hear. So helping people is is good, and that and you anyone just about anyone consider that to be loving. But sometimes you have to say things they don't want to hear. And here's like a here's, Kind of maybe a silly example, but just to get the point of cross. Let's say that I'm in my house, and my house is burning, it's on fire, and I don't realize it. 
the house is on fire. I'm in, a, I'm in an area. I'm not going to be able to get out. And the house is just going to burn down if left unattended to, obviously. Now, if someone were to tell me, hey, man, your house is on fire, is that, is that something I really want to hear? It's not good news. It's not good news to hear that my house is on fire. That's not something I'm going to want to hear. Like, oh, man, my house, you know, like, like what are we doing? My house is on fire. But could you possibly say that, let's say a person comes over to my house, they see the house is on fire, but they come in and they say, well, I know this is really going to upset Dave if I, if, if I tell him that his house is on fire. I mean, that's a, he's, that's a really going to be a lot of damage. It's going to cost him a lot of money. I don't want to upset him. I just want him to feel good. So I'm just going to tell him, hey, man, you're looking good. You're doing great. You're having a good, you, you know, you're having a good day. Okay, great. Thanks. Later. See you. God bless you. And you never tell them that, is, that my house is on fire. Does that person really love me? Because they're afraid to tell me the bad news. They don't know what I'm going to say. They don't want me to feel bad. No, obviously. And again, it's a silly example, but, but the, the loving thing to do is to tell me, hey, look, your house is on fire to save your own life. Get out of here and, and try to stop the damage before it consumes your whole house. That's the loving thing to do, even though it's not pleasant news to have. And this is the aspect of love I think most people don't comprehend, even though it's a real simple concept. But it's one of the most important ways for us to help people. And the number one way to show your love for people is to warn them about the reality of hell. And this is why that silly example, excuse me, that silly example makes sense when you apply it spiritually to hell. A lot of people are worried about what's the person going to think. And this is why so many people have a fear of going out and knocking on doors and talking to strangers about hell and about Jesus Christ and about their soul being saved. They fear it because they're worried about somebody getting mad or getting upset. And oftentimes these liberal churches will say, oh, well, we, just, we need to just show people all the love and then they'll see all the love that we have. And they'll want to have that same love that we have and then they'll come and ask us about it and then we can tell them about Jesus. Well, that statement alone is saying, oh, we have all this love. You don't have that love if you're not going to go out and tell people that they're going to die and go to hell. You simply don't. You need to tell people the truth. And this is loving in truth because the Bible is the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. We need to spread the truth. That is how we're going to love in truth. Don't confuse love with not offending people as so many people do today. They're not synonyms. Obviously, the goal is not to offend people. That's not the goal. We're not going out trying to just get people mad and upset. That's not the whole point of going out. But you shouldn't withhold truth that a person needs to hear just for the sake of not offending them. That's, that's, that is that's is wrong. If someone needs to hear the truth and you're not going to do it because you're just you're worried that they might, be, they might be offended by that statement, that's wrong for you to withhold that truth. That's why when I, when I go soul winning, I try to do this as much as possible. Um, I try to make it very clear that if a person's believing a false gospel, because I've had this conversation plenty of times, you know, you try to be friendly. You're not trying to push people away and get them to shut down and not listen to what you have to say. We're bringing good news. It is good news. But in order to hear the good news, they have to hear the bad news first. People have to understand that, look, we are all sinners. We've all done wrong in God's eyes. And the truth of the matter is that God's punishment for our sins is an eternity of hell. That's the truth. Okay, if I withhold that from a person, I don't love them. If I'm just going to stand here, listen to someone say, yeah, well, I'm a pretty good person, so that's why I'm going to heaven. Because I'm pretty good. I do good things. And I say, oh, yeah, okay. Well, have a good day. I don't love that person one bit because I just let them think that I'm okay with what they just said and that, and that I'm in agreement. Say, yeah, okay, yeah, you're okay. That's just fine. Even though I didn't explicitly say, oh, yeah, that, you know, that is good, even if I don't say anything. The silence is an agreement and, and I'm going to let them leave thinking that what they believe is just fine and that 
Everyone thinks that's fine. It's not a big deal. So when I go out sowing, I try to make sure, you know, obviously I, I, I try to get through the gospel and just and, and show people. But oftentimes I'll run into someone who's really devout in whatever false religion they're in. And um, just like the Jewish man I talked to, or, or even, you know, Pentecostals, whatever, they'll say, yeah, well, oftentimes with Pentecostals they'll say things like, well, you know, you believe in Jesus and I believe in Jesus, so basically it's all okay because we're both going to go to heaven. You know, and they don't think it matters that they think you could lose your salvation because they think, well, like, well I'm not going to lose it anyways. You know, I'm doing good things. And, you know, if, you're, if you keep doing right, you're not going to lose it either. We both believe in Christ, so we're both going to heaven. And, and that's the way they look at it. And if I were to just say, oh, yeah, okay, well, see ya. I'm going to leave them with the impression that what they believe is just fine. When what I need to do is if they're not going to hear the gospel, if they're not going to understand it, if they're not going to accept it, if they could hear it and say, yeah, no, I don't, I don't believe that to be true, they need to understand that their belief is going to damn them to hell for an eternity. People need to hear that. If you don't know that there's a problem, how can you correct it? If I don't know my house is on fire, how can I put it out? If you don't know that your soul is going to go to hell, how can, you, how can you possibly even think about getting saved? That is why it's extremely important. And look, there is no way, there is no nice way to tell somebody that they're going to hell when they die. There's not a nice way to do it. You can, you know, and, and believe me, I try to be nice with people all the time. And, and I, you know, I don't like beating around the bush, but I, you know, I, I try to just say things in a pleasant way or a nice way because you're not trying to offend people. But when it comes down to it, when you say, look, if you don't change what you believe, you're going to hell. You're a burn there forever. That's not a nice thing to hear, but it's needful. People need to hear. Sometimes people just need to get shaken up a little bit and even just think, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe there's something to what this person is saying. Say, because with, a, with some people I've said that to, they, they get like blown away. Like, what? Like, you think I'm going to go to hell? And, and that can make them reset and just kind of think about it. Because this whole time they're thinking, oh, yeah, you know, you're talking about Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And, and they think everything's just fine. But when you say that, it, it really brings the conversation to a head to, to let you understand. Look, you're not getting what I'm saying because... You don't get that, that the gift is free. It's not of works. And if you could lose your salvation, then you believe in a works-based salvation through your bad works. But, um, and that, inherently, that belief makes you not saved. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Our belief is what saves us. Our belief in is what's going to damn us. It's that, that's what God's going to judge us on, is whether or not we have believed on Jesus Christ or not. So the belief is extremely important, and we don't want to let leave people thinking that they're just fine when, in fact, they're not. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4 is the last place that um, we're going to turn tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to tie it all together. We need to love people in deed by doing nice things for them. We also need to love people in truth. Now, loving people in truth is not, is not as easy to do, I think, as loving people in deed. I think it's easier to be able to, to do nice things for people than it is sometimes to say things that you know people aren't going to want to hear. But if you love someone, you're not just going to look the other way. When they are having problems that need to be fixed, and especially when they don't even realize what they are. They don't even realize that they're, they do have a problem. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse number 11 of Ephesians 4. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they, they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So here he's saying, we're going to keep reading, but in the first few verses, 
He's explaining, you know, there's apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors. This is all for the edifying of the saints. It's for building up the church. It's for to bring us all together in unity of faith so that we all believe the same thing. That's why we have teachers and pastors and evangelists so that we can all be taught from the Bible. We could, we could all come to a unity, to, to a belief in the same thing. And that we don't get deceived by these false doctrines, by the slight of men, by people who are, who are waiting and trying to deceive you and teach you false doctrine. We prevent that by having these teachers and pastors and bringing us into unity of faith. But he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we speak the truth. In love, in the way that that's, you know, when we preach on sin, when we preach about hell, when you talk to people about hell, you know, you try to do it in a loving way, but it's the way, it, the, one of the main reasons why it even is loving is because you're telling them the truth. We're speaking the truth from God's word and we're speaking it in love to help them out. Well, you know, I don't tell people that they're going to hell if they don't believe in Christ because I just want them to have a bad day and I want to upset them. I tell them that because it's a problem that they're probably not aware of. They probably don't understand that, oh, you mean if I don't believe in Christ, I'm going to go to hell? They, most, a lot of people don't even realize that. That's the whole point is that yeah, I'm, I'm trying to inform you about the truth. I'm trying to let you know, look, this is the truth. This is God's word and this is what he said. And, and you need to understand this so that you can do what you need to do, which is believe on Christ in order to avoid that horrible place of hell. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse 16, he says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So verse 17 is saying, therefore, so because of all these things, the, the teachers, the unity of faith, speaking the truth in love, and uh, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, the edifying of the body in love. Therefore, I say, therefore, and testify, Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. So he's saying, you know, this is why I'm telling you that you need to not walk like the world walks. You need to not walk like the heathen walk, like the other Gentiles. They're walking in all of this sin. They're walking in lasciviousness. They're, their heart's alienated from God. We don't want to act like them. We don't want to live like them. We don't want to walk like they walk. You need to be different. You haven't learned Christ that way. You need to walk in newness of spirit. That's why he says in verse 21, he says, If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So he goes back to essentially speaking the truth in love, bringing us in unity of faith, by obeying the commandments, by not walking in the ways of the world, by not loving the things of the world, but loving the things which are of the Father. That will help us to have the proper love that we need to have. So we need to make sure as Christians, and this is something we deal with probably on a daily basis, that we have the proper love in our hearts for others. We need to love people in deed, and we need to love people in truth. Those are the two most important things. We need to make sure we're doing nice things for them, even when they don't do nice things to us. And we need to love people with the truth, in truth, by sharing the truth of the Bible. And I'll close on this last point. You know, I've, I've brought this up in the past, but I've had, I had a couple come to me and they're talking about marriage and stuff. And um, one of them had been divorced already. It would have been easy for me to just not say anything and, and, and give my blessings on their, on, their, on their marriage and say, oh yeah, you guys should get married, you know. Um, there's nothing, just, just give my blessings, or not say anything about it. I could have just not said anything. And I probably could have had them come to church for quite a while if I just didn't say anything about that. But I love those people. I led those people to Christ. I, I love them. I have to tell them the truth because here's the thing. 
I would, I would have hated it. I would hate it right now if anybody was withholding some truth from the Bible that I didn't know and I was in sin and I'm doing something wrong or, or I'm about to do something wrong. Better yet, I'm about to do something wrong and I'm talking to someone, I'm talking to a pastor and saying, yeah, you know, I'm just about to go and do this and I'm really excited about it. I want to do this. And it's completely wrong. It's something I shouldn't be doing from the Bible. If I were to do that, I would, be, I would be angry at that pastor. Why didn't you tell me? You know this. You know that this was wrong. Why didn't you tell me about this? Now I have to suffer the consequences from God. Now I have to, to reap what I've sown in breaking God's law and breaking His commandment because you didn't tell me this. You didn't warn me. So that's exactly what I did for this couple. I told him, I said, look, this is what the Bible says. And I try to do it in love. I try to have compassion and show them, hey, look, I know, you know, this, this isn't the best news that you're going to receive today, but this is the truth. And if you're interested in the truth, then I'll tell you the truth. This is, this is what the Bible says. I'll show you the truth. It's written right here. And that's exactly what I did. And I, and I haven't really seen them since then, but they got to hear the truth. And they have no excuse now. If they decide to go out and get married, I don't know. I, who knows what happened to them. But hopefully, hopefully they didn't. Hopefully that stuck with at least one of them. And they said, you know what? I'm not going to do this because I saw it in the Bible and that's not true. But if you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth, even if it means it's going to upset somebody. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. God, help us all to improve the love that we have in our life and the love that we have for others and the love that we have for you. God, help us to... To understand that we need to obey your commandments. That's one way we can show our love for you. God, help us to be able to love others and, and to can overcome evil with good when they wrong us. Dear Lord, help us not to have bitterness in our hearts, but to continue to love people. And God, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us and the love that you showed for us when Jesus died on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.